Some bands think of rock as daytime music. Others consider it a road map to the blackest part of the night. The Doors always took their inspiration from the darkness. Led by singer Jim Morrison, the band combined poetry and theater. They investigated places where dreams and nightmares collided. They brought an underground vision to the top of the charts. The Doors are legends. This is their story. Bring on food to the other side. Bring on food to the other side. Bring on food. 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 During the early 1960s, California was a hotbed of rock and roll. The Beach Boys set the tone for a lifestyle of fun, fun, fun. By mid-decade, San Francisco is a haven for the hippies and their smile on your brother attitude. But in Los Angeles, the doors left flower power to rot on the vine. They looked for truth by moonlight. Separating themselves from hippie values of optimism and community, the doors created one of rock's most ominous sounds. At the center was Jim Morrison, a film student and aspiring poet. In a theatrical moment, he called himself the Lizard King and told journalists that the doors were erotic politicians. I think uh, uh, these days, especially in, in the States, you have to be uh, a politician or an assassin or something to really be a superstar. Like the stones in the Velvet Underground, the doors flirted with danger. They stood for investigating the extremes of every situation. We want the world and we want it! No! Morrison's emotions were extreme too. He could be cerebral, he could be derelict. The tension between the two sides was explosive. He reacted against all forms of authority. It made him one of the most charismatic and provocative rock stars who ever lived. One of the most bewildering too. No one, not even the other doors, knew what he would do next. James Douglas Morrison was born in 1943 in Florida. His father, a captain in the Navy, was fighting in World War II when his son was born. Jim's middle name was inspired by General Douglas MacArthur, but the discipline of military life wasn't his destiny. Steve Morrison's duties often kept him away from his children. The family moved frequently. By the time Jim turned four, they had bounced from Florida to D.C. to New Mexico. He never settled into one particular environment. A chubby kid, Jim had a wild streak. He taunted his siblings, Ann and Andy, and got attention by throwing fits. And when that didn't work, he'd retreat to his books. A favorite subject was reptiles. Life in Albuquerque provided plenty of opportunity to investigate the desert creatures. Young Jim was fascinated by lizards. I am a lizard king. I can do anything. As an adult, Morrison told his friends that he had a life-altering experience at the age of four. While the Morrison family was driving to Santa Fe one day, they came across a crash on the highway. A truck had swerved off the road and into the desert. Several Native Americans had been riding in the back. One died in the crash. Some were thrown from the truck, badly injured. The Morrison stopped to help, and Jim couldn't take his eyes off the scene. Years later, he said that an Indian spirit took possession of him that day. Indians scattered us on the highway bleeding. Ghosts crowd the young child's fragile eggshell mind. In high school in Virginia, Jim shunned hobbies and sports. He was a class clown who loved the satire of Mad Magazine, but managed to get good grades. An IQ test placed him in the genius range. He investigated philosophy, mysticism, and art. Jack Kerouac's On the Road was a favorite book. Morrison was attracted to an anything goes kind of freedom. Soon, Nietzsche was also on his reading list. 
He often rebelled against the middle-class life his family lived. Jim relished the chance to be on his own in college. First, he went to school in Florida, where he read incessantly. He was intrigued by texts that dealt with the psychology of crowds. At one point, Morrison urged some friends to help him start a riot, just to see what the outcome would be. They declined. Against his parents' wishes, he transferred to UCLA to study film. He told his friends that film was where the unconscious part of life was most eloquently expressed. Morrison was taken with two kinds of motion pictures, surrealism and cinema verite. He was fascinated by the difference between sensual dreams and blunt reality. Jim made one film while he was at UCLA. He got a D on it. He fell in with several students who were dedicated to art, and some who made an art of partying. One pal was in a band with his brothers on the weekends. His name was Ray Manzarek. Ray liked Jim. He thought Morrison was witty, devilish, and smart. Manzarek's group, Rick and the Ravens, was a bar band. They did tunes like Louie Louie, and they'd invite fellow students up on stage to sing along. One night at a local bar, Jim joined too. But he was shy and didn't do much more than shake a tambourine. After graduation, Morrison took an apartment in LA's bohemian neighborhood, Venice Beach. There he read the poems of Rimbaud and wrote his own verse. He told one friend he wanted to start a band. I never went to concerts, he said, but I heard in my head a band and singing in an audience. He slept on rooftops near the ocean. He crashed at friends' houses. Morrison was living the poet's life. The afternoon he bumped into Ray Manzarek on the beach changed both of their lives. School was finished, we had nothing to do, and uh, Jim was going to New York, I was going to stay in Los Angeles, and about a month into the summer vacation, who comes walking down the beach but Jim Morrison. And I asked him, what are you up to, man? I thought you were going to New York. He said, no, I decided to stay here and write some songs and stuff. I said, well, go ahead, sing one of the songs. And then he did Moonlight Drive. And I thought the words are just amazing. Let's swim to the moon. Uh -huh. Let's climb through the tide. And it's right someone to believe in him and help him set his words to music. He moved in with Ray and began to work on songs. They called themselves The Doors, after Aldous Huxley's book, The Doors of Perception. Huxley's title itself came from William Blake's line, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. At first, The Doors had no drummer, that changed when Manzarek met John Densmore at a meditation class. John was an inventive drummer without a regular gig. He was playing fraternity parties for pocket money when he met The Doors. Together with a bass player, Morrison, Densmore, and the Manzarek brothers cut a demo tape that included Moonlight Drive, Hello, I Love You, and a tune called Go Insane. Columbia Records signed the group but then dragged their feet about recording sessions. It was clear the band was not a priority. Disheartened, Ray Manzarek's brothers went back to their day jobs. It looked like the doors were finished. In fact, they had not yet started. In the next remarkable year, the doors would bring Jim Morrison's vision to life. Jim Morrison, Ray Manzarek, and John Densmore wanted to keep the Doors together, but they had lost two members and were getting no support from their record company. Densmore said he knew a good guitarist, Robbie Krieger. When I first uh, heard about the Doors, 
John Dinsmore, who I'd known in school, was telling me about this group that he was in called The Doors. And uh, they had this wild, crazy guy, Jim Morrison, who was going to be the lead singer, even though he couldn't sing at the time. But I knew that they were going to be good because they had these great songs. The first time Robbie rehearsed with The Doors, he played the snaky, bottleneck guitar lines that are the signature of Moonlight Drive. Everyone knew he was perfect. The doors were fully formed. Hi, Dave. Robbie Krieger. Age? 22 years old. Occupation? Uh, guitar. Name? John Densmore. Age? 23. Occupation? Percussionist. Name? Raymond Daniel Manzer. Age? Born 212-39. Occupation? Musician. Organist. Name? Uh, Jim. Occupation? Some of those who came to hear The Doors rehearse thought they were too weird. Jim went through periods of self-doubt as a singer. Sometimes he would stand off to the side of the stage. Club owners were bewildered. There was no bass player. Jim didn't look anyone in the eye. No other band sounded like or acted like The Doors. We were all acid heads looking for another way to get high said Manzarek. We found it in the music. The songs made plenty of room for poetic and musical improvisations. If an interesting tangent popped up, they'd follow it till it reached an emotional crescendo. This gave them an unusual sound. Loose, but explosive. The music would settle into a kind of hypnotic uh, river of sound, which um, would leave me free to kind of make up anything that came into my head at the time. You see my grasshopper, mama? Looking real good. Uh-oh, I blew it. It's a moth. Uh. At first, the doors were considered outsiders on the L.A. scene. But finally, they got a gig at a cheesy Hollywood club called the London Fog. Jim grew more confident on stage, and his singing improved. His blend of insolence and vulnerability seduced many listeners. Before long, the Doors became the house band at the prestigious Whiskey A Go Go. Jim's improvised passages included lots of sexual innuendo, often stoned, He'd hurl himself around stage, writhing with the rhythms. Other times, he remained motionless, with his head hung, whispering into the mic. The other doors reacted to Jim's moves musically. It was a far cry from the bounciness of other L.A. bands, like Buffalo Springfield or The Birds. The mood I get for most of it is kind of a heavy, kind of a sort, sort of gloomy feeling, you yeah. know? Like, uh, uh, like of someone not quite at home, or, you know, or not quite, not quite relaxed. The booking agent at the Whiskey said Morrison's dirty street clothes weren't right for the stage. She helped him choose a skin-tight leather outfit to wear. Already dangerous looking, Jim took on a regal air. He was a young Adonis with a sexual magnetism of early Elvis. Women made up much of the band's audience. Pam Corson made a point of being at every Doors gig. It wasn't long before she became Morrison's girlfriend. But it was not just the female fans who were captivated by Jim's performances. Crowds gathered each night at the Whiskey to see what kind of crazed theatrics Morrison would come up with. One night, filled to the brim with LSD, he produced a defining moment during The End, a song about a romantic breakup, Jim improvised a new section that had blatant edible references. Father? Yes, son. I want to kill you. Mm-hmm. 
The doors were fired as soon as they left the stage, but the Sunset Strip buzzed about their performance for weeks. Columbia let the band go without ever releasing an album. Electra Records moved in. In September of 66, Morrison, Manzarek, Krieger and Densmore went into the studio with producer Paul Rothschild. Manzarek called the creative process a sort of a seance. The result was one of rock's most electrifying albums. One of the most eerie, too. The first time the Doors tried to capture the end in the studio, it didn't work. Jim was tripping and the focus wasn't there. A few days later, Morrison felt more secure. With all the studio lights off and a single candle burning, the doors got the take they wanted. Eleven minutes long, the end was a testimony to brutal self-examination. It was full of anger, mystery, and destruction. The doors had captured their essence on tape. Later that night, when the studio was closed, Morrison returned broke in and sprayed a fire extinguisher all over the room where he had sung. The end gave the doors the confidence they needed to go further into theatrical territory. They wanted their music to roam through the listener's psyche. What do you hope it would do to its audience? I hope it will leave them puzzled. Puzzle's a good word. Uh, but puzzled at liking you or puzzled at disliking you? That's part of the puzzlement. <laughs> you know the day destroys the night. Night divides the day. Break on Through was The Doors' first single. It was a local hit in L.A., but struggled to get on the national charts. Electra put up The Doors' billboard on the Sunset Strip something that had never been done for rock musicians. It gained The Doors notoriety with the media. In San Francisco, The Doors played the Fillmore Auditorium and Avalon Ballroom. They shared bills with bands as different as The Young Rascals and The Grateful Dead. When they got to New York, the press was waiting for them. Critics heralded the band as a great underground group. The Doors went back to California triumphant. For their second single, Electra suggested that The Doors release Light My Fire, the first song Robbie Krieger had ever written. At six minutes, it was way too long. AM radio wouldn't touch it. The label decided to edit out the organ solo in the middle of the track and tested it on the airwaves. It started to move, and FM stations began playing the uncut version as well. By July of 1967, Light My Fire was the number one single in the country. In a matter of weeks, the doors were rock stars. The wild ride had begun. Everything exploded in Miami. At a packed concert hall, an inebriated Morrison railed about revolution. You're all a bunch of fucking idiots! Miami was chaos. Audience members brought a lamb up to the stage. Jim took the hat off a cop and threw it into the crowd. It was more of a circus than a concert. Jim started a strip tease and asked the audience if they wanted to see his penis. He prowled the stage, feigning masturbation. A brawl broke out. Some of the audience members swear Jim exposed himself. Others said he didn't. That it was all pretend. Confusion, anger, and excitement erupted. It was Morrison's most notorious moment. 
His dedication to spectacle was triumphant. We have taken out two warrants for Jim Morrison. One of them is for indecent exposure. The other is for the use of obscene languages uh, during his performance at uh, Dunner Key Saturday night. Morrison turned himself in to the authorities when he got back to L.A. He was charged with a felony. Sixteen states banned the group from ever appearing again. And in Miami, a conservative group staged a decency rally. The doors are out to uh, make their own scene. It was a bad scene, and like I say, it was completely unwarranted. And I just want to know if anyone has c the courage enough to stand up and do something about the trash that's being, being brought into Miami. I've heard that the doors, they got kicked out of other places uh, because of the riots and their um, indecent exposure and, and their, um, their, their talking. And I feel that uh, we have to do something about this. This is, this is real disgusting. And how, my children, if I, when I grow up and have children, do I want them in, a, in an environment like this? I mean, is this progress or uh, are we decaying in a way? In the months following Miami, Jim's constant drinking made him look heavy. He wore a thick beard and sunglasses. The counterculture sex symbol was turning into a haunted recluse. Jim was busted for drunk and disorderly conduct in Phoenix after some obnoxious behavior on a plane flight. The charges were dropped when it turned out the stewardess had mistaken one of Jim's rowdy pals for Morrison. Jim's bad reputation was overshadowing the music. As work started on Morrison Hotel, some of the press began calling Jim a has-been. The felony charges were hanging over his head. Jim mumbled to the other doors that he was having a nervous breakdown. He was 26 years old. In 1970, the doors were suffering from a critical backlash and Jim Morrison was facing felony charges for allegedly exposing himself in Miami. The Doors knew they had to make a musical statement strong enough to silence the doubters. Their new record, Morrison Hotel, was a return to stripped down rock and roll. It avoided cosmic lyrics and jazz chords. Instead, it featured Bo Diddley rhythms, blues riffs, and lots of Morrison wailing. The cover photo was shot in the Skid Row Hotel in L.A. The picture on the back was of a raunchy bar room. The message was clear. The doors were dumping their pretenses. The band was concentrating on down and dirty rock. Some of the group's teeny bopper fans drifted away. But the doors' hardcore audience liked what they heard. As Morrison Hotel was pushing its way up the charts, a book of Jim's poetry was released. The Lords and the New Creatures contained some of his verse from earlier days. As a Doors live record was released, Morrison dwelled on the pending Miami trial. He had cause to be worried. Well, in the realm of art and theater, I, th I do think that uh, there should be complete freedom for the artist and performer. Uh, I'm not personally that uh, convinced that uh, nudity is always, you know, a necessary part of, uh, you know, a play or a film, but uh, the artist should feel free to use it if he feels like it. Jim hoped the trial would be seen as a fight over freedom of expression. Instead, it turned into a pop culture carnival with crowds of teenage fans outside the building. Jim took the stand and said he didn't remember if he had actually exposed himself. He was too drunk to recall. The jury decided he had. Though they let him go on some counts, Morrison was convicted on the charge of indecent exposure. He was sentenced to six months of hard labor. His lawyers filed an appeal. Toward the end of the trial, Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin both died from abuse of drugs and booze. Morrison told some pals, you're drinking with number three. Jim was depressed. The wear and tear of drinking and the threat of prison wounded his interest in music making. When they went in to make their next record, the doors weren't very energetic. Their longtime producer, Paul Rothschild, got frustrated and quit. He said that the new tapes sounded like cocktail jazz. 
Rothschild's departure shook the doors and forced them to work harder. Along with their engineer, Bruce Botnick, the band produced themselves. They enjoyed the new freedom. The result was L.A. Woman. It was eloquent in its description of apprehension and fear. Riders on the Storm was a dreamy tale of a serial killer that set the mood for the danger that was lurking ahead. Riders on the Storm Late in December of 1970, Morrison cut a spoken word record of poetry. He showed up at the studio with a bottle and some friends. It was his birthday. For hours, he acted out his verse. Poetry was his first love. He was thrilled to finally have the opportunity to document it. Awake. Shake dreams from your hair, my pretty child, my sweet one. Choose the day and choose the sign of your day, the day's divinity. First thing you see. The doors went off to Dallas and New Orleans to do shows. The first was fine. The second was awful. Drunk and drowsy, Morrison continuously smashed the mic stand into the stage, mumbling to himself. Densmore walked away from his drum set. The tour was canceled. The doors were disintegrating. Jim Morrison was burned out and facing jail. The Doors had completed their obligation to Electra Records. Morrison told his bandmates and friends that he and Pam were going to Paris to be alone. He wanted to spend time reading and writing. He had to get away from the trappings of rock. I must find a place to hide, a place for me to hide. L.A. Woman was released and the song Love Her Madly was a hit. But Jim was enjoying the calm of French Bohemia and the freedom of anonymity. He told friends that people think of me as a rock star. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Back in LA, the doors rehearsed without him. Even when his life was calm, Jim had to contend with alcoholism. After a couple of months of casual living, he slipped into his manic behavior once again. On July 2nd, 1971, in Paris, he went to see a Robert Mitchum movie and came back home complaining of chest pains. In the middle of that night, Pam found him dead in the bathtub. Only Pam and the doctor who signed the death certificate ever saw Jim Morrison's body. There was no autopsy. That prompted endless speculation. Did Morrison fake his death and disappear to get away from the courts and the spotlight? Did he buy heroin from a French dealer and OD? The rumors were wild and varied. He was already an international star. Death would make Jim Morrison a legend. In the middle of 1967, the Doors were a hot new band with a number one single. They didn't waste time following up. Many of the lyrics for their second album were taken from Jim Morrison's notebooks. Musically, the band wanted to enhance the sound of their first album. They used echo, Moog synthesizer, backwards piano, harpsichord, and bits of electronic processing. Krieger's guitar lines were increasingly graceful, but they had a sting. Densmore's drumming was always inventive. Success surrounded the band. But the second album's title lived up to the Doors' mysterious image, Strange Days. The Doors opened for Simon and Garfunkel in New York at the end of the summer. The crowd didn't buy Jim's dramatic moves. Some of them even laughed. Jim operated on impulse. At his best, he was captivating. At his worst, he was a clown. After the Simon and Garfunkel show, he knew everybody wasn't going to swoon to his antics. That didn't mean Morrison was going to change for anyone. When the Doors performed Light My Fire on the Ed Sullivan Show, the producer demanded that the line, Girl, we couldn't get much higher, be removed. It was too blatant a drug reference. In the dressing room, the Doors agreed. But on stage, Jim sang the original line. That was their last Sullivan appearance. 
On stage and off, Morrison's mischief was becoming obnoxious. Drunk and stoned one night, he tried to rip apart the apartment of Electra's president. He and Pam began to have heated squabbles, too. Jim visited a psychiatrist, but didn't stick around for many sessions. At the age of 23, he was becoming one of the most influential singers in America. This power expanded his already healthy sense of self-confidence. Jim's singing became more expressive, full of grunts and howls. Ray compared Jim to a shaman who took the audience on a mystical journey. What do you think the role of a, a rock shaman is in a time of, say, social tur turmoil? I don't think the shaman, from what I've read, is uh, really too interested in defining his role in, in society. He's just more interested in um, uh, pursuing his own fantasies. Morrison said performing for people was like presiding over a crisis situation. He often leapt and fell off the stage. The music and the action became increasingly cathartic. Some writers suggested Jim was possessed. In New Haven, Connecticut, Morrison demonstrated his defiance. Jim was making out with a fan before a show in October of 67 when he was confronted by a policeman. The cop told Jim to clear the room. Jim mouthed off and got a blast of mace in the eyes. The doors went on anyway. During one song, Jim began telling the audience what had happened backstage and was viciously teasing the police. The cops threw on the house lights and dragged Morrison off the stage. He was charged with breach of peace and immoral exhibition. The FBI opened a file on Jim Morrison. Now known by every rock fan in the world, the Doors began work on their third album, Waiting for the Sun. It was to have a whole side dedicated to Morrison's extended poem, The Celebration of the Lizard. Hopes were high that it would be his masterpiece, but things were unraveling. Pam was urging Jim to quit the Doors and lead a quieter life as a poet. Booze became a steady companion for the singer. Occasionally, his writing was incoherent. The trappings of pop stardom made Jim wonder about his effectiveness as an artist. John Densmore lost patience with the Doors' lack of focus in the studio. One night in the studio, I said, that's it, goodbye, Thank you. Um, to the whole band, and I left. And I came back the next day because I couldn't give up uh, my art. But that was my way of saying, we got to stop this, you know, destruction. Densmore's action sent a message to the others. Jim was veering out of control. The band hired a bodyguard to keep him away from whiskey. Well, show me the way to the next whiskey bar. Keeping Morrison straight was impossible. The Doors became increasingly frustrated with working on Celebration of the Lizard. The peace didn't hold up. The friction between young protesters and the government over the war in Vietnam was at its zenith. The Doors released the highly theatrical song, The Unknown Soldier. They also produced a promotional film for the track. At the end of it, Morrison mimed being shot dead, a martyr. Some radio stations played the song, but many thought it was too controversial or just too strange to be commercial. Do you think you're a political girl? The music can't help but reflecting things that are happening around it. Morrison didn't seem to care about chart success. He made a game out of testing his own physical limits. He jumped out of moving cars. He hung from the ledges of hotels. Morrison could provoke the audience into rushing the stage. Doors concerts began to generate riots. If Jim could not mesmerize the huge crowds as he had club audiences, he would instead drive them into a frenzy. The Doors hadn't had a hit song in the year since Light My Fire. They released 
Hello, I Love You, in June of 68. It was their second number one. But its simplicity caused many fans to wonder about the band's direction. In all honesty, Hello, I Love You was released because we felt it had the best chance on the top 40 charts. Waiting for the Sun came out a few weeks later and went gold quickly. The only thing saved from Celebration of the Lizard was a four-minute song called Not to Touch the Earth. It contained the line, I am the Lizard King. I can do anything. Jim Smith continued to grow. Ladies and gentlemen, from Los Angeles, California, the Dogs! Concert venues began getting bigger, but the Hollywood Bowl and Madison Square Garden didn't supply the kind of intimacy the Doors were used to. And of course, they were expected to play their hits. That kind of formula was at odds with their roots in improvisation. In the early days, the band made up its tunes as it went along. Now they felt a commitment to give the audience what it came for. Morrison began scripting some of his stage falls, a showbiz move. Teeny boppers filled the shows, and Morrison believed they were missing the depth of his lyrics. He was frustrated. One day Jim announced he was quitting. Ray talked him into staying for another six months. Roll, you definitely generate an atmosphere or a mood which might be characterized as rebellion, chaos, disorder, and activity that appears to have no meaning. On stage, Morrison's sexual overtones became more and more graphic. Local police began to monitor the Doors shows for indecent or illegal activity. There was a shoving match in Phoenix as fans rushed the stage after Morrison had taunted the audience. No matter how hot it got, Morrison couldn't resist fueling the fire. Come on, come on, come on, come on, now touch me, babe. If you see that I am not afraid. For their next single, the Doors added an orchestra. Touch Me had a Las Vegas tinge to it. At the LA Forum, with the orchestra in tow, the band didn't go over. Morrison asked the crowd what they wanted. Light my fire, they roared. Celebration of the Lizard is what they got. With the death of Jim Morrison, the future of the Doors was uncertain. After much internal debate, Ray Manzarek, Robbie Krieger and John Densmore decided to continue as a trio. They released two records after Morrison's death. Ray sang most of the songs. Neither album had much commercial success. They split up in 1973. In April of 74, Pamela Morrison was found dead from a heroin overdose in Los Angeles. The fans who believed Jim was still alive imagined she'd faked her death to join him. In 1978, the Doors created new music and sound collages to go along with the poetry tapes Jim recorded during his 27th birthday session in 1970. They were released by Elektra as an American prayer. The legacy of the Doors continues. In 1979, Francis Ford Coppola used The End to set the mood of horror and devastation in his Vietnam opus, Apocalypse Now. Hollywood also churned out a big screen bio of the band's turbulent career, directed by Oliver Stone. Door songs became fixtures on classic rock radio. In 1997, Ray, Robbie and John went into a Los Angeles studio to put music to a newly discovered Morrison song called Orange County Sweet. I'm very pleased with the music. Very proud to have made the music with uh, Dennis Moore Krieger and Morrison. And uh, those guys are, they were great to work with and I think we, uh, I think we captured something, captured a moment in time, and captured also a timeless moment that'll perhaps uh, live on into eternity. Always a friend of mayhem, the Doors interfered with the status quo at every opportunity. 
There are many rock fans who believe that's exactly what the music should do. Entranced by the hostility of modern life, Jim Morrison used hysteria and literature as a springboard into salvation. During the fevered years from 1967 to 1970, the Doors made some of rock's most eternally disturbing music. For those who were there and were awake, the music of the Doors will always summon a passionate, dangerous era. For those too young to know how the songs felt when they were new, the Doors offer a glimpse into the emotional complexities of a time too often reduced to nostalgic simplicities. The Doors represent the 60s dichotomies of artistic ambition and rampant hedonism, flower power and anarchy, peace and violence, LSD and Jack Daniels. They were the antidote that contained the disease. They paid a terrible price for going into the unexplored regions, but they brought back incredible stories.